Hi all, I'm Megha Gehlabert. I'm a biology faculty here at Ask IITNs. And today we are going to do the one and only easiest chapter that is there in the 10th standard, that is the management of our natural resources, okay? And it's very important for you guys to understand that as easy as this chapter is, it is very scoring. And most of the questions which are very, very quick to answer come from this chapter, which we'll be reading along. And I'll be uh, telling you, marking those questions so that it is easier for you to score more, ex uh, more marks in the exams, okay? Now, moving forward to this chapter, although we are going to learn a lot in this particular chapter, we'll be learning about the different type of natural resources. We'll be learning about different types of movements which took place, what should we do uh, for the sake of the proper development of our uh, human species alongside the natural uh, topography or the nature that we have here on earth so that there's a proper sustainable development. Apart from that, we'll be learning about different type of conservations, how do we conserve the biodiversity or the natural resources and so on. We're going to learn actually a lot about this chapter, right? So starting from the topics that we'll be covering here, today are the introduction, the types of natural resources, forest and wildlife, and the conservation of biodiversity. Out of this, this is a very important topic. And out of this, multiple questions come, OK? So it's very good for if you, you know, kind of note this down. And if you kind of uh, is able to, and if you kind of are able to memorize them, you know, it'll be very good for you. Now, see, it's very important for you to understand, first of all, natural resources, what are those? Everything that nature gives us, in the simple words, everything that nature gives us, everything, uh, you know, uh, starting from the birds to the animals to the mountains to the uh, water, every single thing is, is you know, is a natural resource. And what is a resource? First of all, resource is anything which is useful, okay? Anything which is useful, which is useful. There are multiple type of resources for the starters. We have the natural resources which are provided by the nature, which we'll be learning about a little bit more in this upcoming uh, session. And second is the man-made resources. Now, man-made resources are the ones which are produced by the human beings. For example, this stylus that I have with the help of which I'm able to write on the screen is the man-made resource. The spectacles that I have with the help of which I can see, uh, thank God, is a uh, man-made resource, right? So resources basically are either man-made or natural. Man-made or natural. All right. I hope you can differentiate between both of these uh, properly now. Apart from their origin, this is on the basis of the origin, Bacha. Apart from the origin, we can also conclude the types of resources based on if we can use them time and again, if we can use them, you know, for a longer period of time, or if we can use them very, uh, let's say, cautiously so that we can have them for the future as well. And on the basis of that, we have the resources such as the renewable and non-renewable renewable and non-renewable so it's very important for you to understand that renewable are the resources such as the sunlight wind which could be used time and again the tidal energy etc etc but non-renewable are the one which cannot be used earlier water came into the renewable resource but nowadays water is also a non-renewable resource because we have been wasting it you know so much and also according to the recent news um, an iceberg the size of the New York City actually larger than the New York City has been broken up into the Antarctica now at that pace I don't think the water is a renewable resource at all you know in the present scenario apart from that we have the fossil fuels which is like the biggest example everybody has uh, studied till now all the petrols diesels etc 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 those are the non-renewable resources right apart from that if we talk about the nature how nature exactly is interacting with us you know we all interact with our surroundings that is what we call as the environment where all the living things and non-living things interact with each other in order to you know comprehend the proper living and uh, stay in a very peaceful and harmonious manner also to develop and proliferate or to flourish properly right so with the help of that 
natural heritage that is the land water that all has been used by the human beings very judiciously judiciously very properly for the development of their own trade for example the fisheries tourism mining forestry etc etc on top of that we have the biodiversity now biodiversity here is one of the biggest resources that we have you know it's very important biodiversity is very very important for maintaining the balance in the nature that is why it is the biggest resource right now for what exactly is the biodiversity we'll be understanding with the help of our video okay now starting with this video let's get on with it and i'll be explaining everything on the way as well our planet's diverse thriving ecosystems may seem like permanent fixtures but they're actually vulnerable to collapse. Jungles can become deserts, and reefs can become lifeless rocks, even without cataclysmic events like volcanoes and asteroids. What makes one ecosystem strong and another weak in the face of change? The answer, to a large extent, is biodiversity. Biodiversity is built out of three intertwined features, ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity. Now see, uh, remember when I told you how biodiversity is the most important natural resource that we have? It's because it is very much important for the sake of balance, right? So all the balance that is being maintained by the ecosystem, the diversity of ecosystem, as in there could be a marine ecosystem, there could be a land ecosystem, there could be a desert ecosystem, a forest ecosystem, all of that. On top of which we have the species diversity, as in, you know, the variety of species, monkeys, snakes, um, birds, butterflies etc etc and then we have the genetic diversity since all of you must have covered the chapter heredity and evolution you're well aware about what genetics is right basically the dna which we have in the nucleus is what the genetic actually is right now moving on with the video the more intertwining there is between these features the denser and more resilient the weave becomes take the amazon rainforest one of the most biodiverse regions on earth Due to its complex ecosystems, huge mix of species, and the genetic variety within those species, here are tangled liana vines, which crawl up from the forest floor to the canopy, intertwining with treetops and growing thick wooded stems that support these towering trees. Helped along by the vines, trees provide the seeds, fruits, and leaves to herbivores such as the tapir and the agouti, which disperse their seeds throughout the forest so they can grow. Leftovers are consumed by the millions of insects that decompose and recycle nutrients to create rich soil. The rainforest is a huge system filled with many smaller systems like this, each packed with interconnected species. Every link provides stability to the next, strengthening biodiversity's weave. That weave is further reinforced by the genetic diversity within individual species, now, before we go any further, it's uh, see, you guys do understand that we just talked about how exactly different type of species that are helping in maintaining the balance by the proper food cycle. For example, we have the autotrophs, which are the trees which pro produce their own food, auto self of nutrition self nutrition that is what the plants are doing okay and then we have the plants uh, giving the food to the herbivores that is the heterotroph hetero different trough nutrition so depending upon the different organism for the nutrition we have the heterotroph which eat the you know um the fruits and the leaves and the grass etc etc so when they die or when they are killed by the carnivores and then carnivores die uh, we have the decomposers which grow on dead and decaying animals for example the fungus the mushrooms etc etc et right so there are different things uh, which basically go ahead and maintain the balance in the ecosystem now moving forward which allows them to cope with changes species that lack genetic diversity due to isolation or low population numbers are much more vulnerable to fluctuations caused by climate change disease or habitat fragmentation whenever a species disappears because of its weakened gene pool a knot is untied and parts of the net disintegrate. So, what if we were to remove one species from the rainforest? Would the system fall apart? Probably not. The volume of species, their genetic diversity, and the complexity of the ecosystems form such rich biodiversity in this forest that one species gap in the weave won't cause it to unravel. The forest can stay resilient and recover from change. 
but that's not true in every case. In some environments, before uh, you know, moving forward to the another environment and cases, let's just you know give the analysis of what we just saw right now. We saw how exactly if we just break one single uh, knot of the of the complete cycle, if the cycle is complex and if the cycle is filled with the variety of the organisms, the entire cycle won't fall apart. Okay, it won't all collapse. But if there is less diversity of the species and if is, you know, everything is hanging by a little thread that is going to cause problems. And that is why we should uh, kind of, you know, start conserving and thinking about the biodiversity. Now talking about the different environments that are there. Environments, taking away just one important component can undermine the entire system. Take coral reefs, for instance. Many organisms in a reef are dependent on the coral. It provides key microhabitats, shelter and breeding grounds for thousands of species of fish, crustaceans, and mollusks. Corals also form interdependent relationships with fungi and bacteria. The coral itself is a loom that allows the tangled net of biodiversity to be woven. That makes coral a keystone organism, one that many others depend on for their survival. So what happens when destructive fishing practices, pollution, and ocean acidification weaken coral or even kill it altogether? Exactly what you might think. The loss of this keystone species leaves its dependence at a loss too, threatening the entire fabric of the reef. Ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity together form the complex tangled weave of biodiversity that is vital for the survival of organisms on Earth. We humans are woven into this biodiversity too. When just a few strands are lost, our own well-being is threatened. Cut too many links and we risk unraveling it all. What the future brings is unpredictable, but biodiversity can give us an insurance policy, Earth's own safety net, to safeguard our survival. Right, so what you exactly understood by the video is that there are some keystone species which are extremely important, which can hold everything together, but if they are attacked, everything is going to fall apart. Other than that, there are species which are helping in maintaining the balance, but let's say if they were to collapse or if they were to extend, the entire system will still hold up, okay? So it's not that we have to just save the keystone species in order to survive, in order to, you know, keep a hand at the planet, but all the species in order to survive and uh, help it thrive properly as well. Okay, now that being said, we're going to move forward with the presentation and the lesson. All right, now that being said, we're going to move forward to the different types of the natural resources. See, I did tell you that there are different type of natural resources, which we'll be talking about, okay? So starting with the different types, let's just study about how we have the oil and coal and natural gas, metals, stones, sand, etc., 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 apart from the air, sunlight, soil, water, birds, animal, basically everything which is coming from the nature is a natural resource. Source, okay and it helps us in the surviving we can make food we can uh, drive our motorbikes or the cars we can basically do a lot of things why because we have a lot of natural resources so if we talk about them one by one we basically have the water first of all which is like extremely important right but before that let's just you know uh, give a little idea to what exactly we have as the renewable and the non-renewable if we categorize them into the renewable and non-renewable, we are going to have the renewable as the sunlight, air, or soil, water. Water not so much, so we are going to put it aside. Non-renewable are the fossil fuels, Okay, metals, minerals, etc. Now that being said, we basically have a well categorized, uh, you know, a well categorized group. Okay, now moving forward to the water, first of all, which is like the extremely important natural resource. 
if we talk about the water water basically is uh, let's say all the cellular forms all the living forms of life all of them require water because even our own body 70% water right so it is the most important of all the uh, resources that we have onto the terrestrial surface or onto the surface of earth for that matter right and despite you know nature's uh, monsoon and the rivers and and springs and everything we still have a large reservoir of the underground water as well right you must have studied about everything in the in the earlier classes or juvenile classes right so we just have to understand how do we help in conserving the water because even after all of that we still are depleting water we still are polluting water we basically are you know exploiting every single thing that we have at our hands and we are not thinking about the future now that being said let's just go ahead by uh, you know starting with the importance of water how 3/4 uh, of the earth surface is water how 97.5% of water on the other hand is you know all saline basically you know everything is you know ocean water we cannot drink it it's not fit for the consumption on and we just have about 2.5% of the fresh water earlier let's say when i was in the school the amount of fresh water that was present in the rivers and glaciers was 3.1 now and now it has reduced to 2.5 do you see how drastic the changes are in just a few years now that is also a very big concern that we should you know ponder upon in order for us to survive in the future apart from that all the you know of uh, let's say 40% of the uh, earth population or world's population lives in the arid or the semi arid regions and they spend substantial or tenacious amount of time and energy and efforts and everything in obtaining what water and we still are depleting it right so it's very important for us to irrigate uh, you know our crops in order to provide the uh, provide ourselves with the food uh, to provide ourselves with the proper living we need water for the survival as well and for that we need to do the water harvesting because that is the only thing that can help us right now and if we talk about the water harvesting we have multiple techniques uh, which can help in you know uh, which can help in obtain the uh, rain water right we can capture the water from the rooftop we can capture the water from the uh, local local catchment areas or you know the local public areas which have like big roofs we can set the water harvesting system there we can uh, help uh, in saving the water from the local streams in order to avoid the excess flooding or the watershed management for that matter so you should understand as much as water we are harvesting it is going to help us okay and water harvesting has been a big big part of our own culture for a very longer period of time and that is why we are going to study water harvesting in about two methods we are going to study the traditional water harvesting and the modern water modern water harvesting right see we have kunds khadins bandhis tankas different type of traditional water harvesting system which were very very prevalent in the older times okay starting uh, with the kunds and i'm going to write this down here for you so that you can note it down and then we am going to explain okay kunds and khadins and bandhis and we have the tankas now see kunds basically are let's say uh the kind of systems which are found in the desert regions most of all okay and it is sort of an underground tank kund is basically an underground tank and whenever uh, even if a little rainfall is there in the kund it is opened and you know it everything you know let's uh, onto the falling of rain water inside the kund and then it is covered properly and then it is uh, like covered with the lid 
and the lid is very heavy it is usually made up of cement nowadays earlier it was made up of heavy blocked uh, heavy block of stones okay so in the in those kunds uh, or kundis for that matter uh, the underground tank it was basically you know primarily developed for the drinking water problems okay so once that was done once the water was collected it was uh, covered with the lid and on top of that we had the jute bags covering it okay and you usually is mostly in the um, rajasthan regions then we have the khadans khadans uh, are the kind of harvest surfaces which uh, take up the water run of water for the agriculture right let me just explain it a little better to you see this is the khadan system that i was talking about when i talk about the khadan system it used usually is to catch the run of water from the agriculture so what do we have we have the catchment area catchment catchment area is usually high okay it's high up so that water can slide off or water can just you know run off and then we have a lower ground a lower ground like this which we call as the khadan or the cropped area which is you know either deliberately dug up uh, in order to maintain the lower area so that all the water which is just you know running off from the catchment area could be collected into that particular low uh, khadan or the cropped area now it's very important to contain that water as well now to contain that water we build the khadan band khadan band is kind of a dam thingy or a wall thingy which is built in order to uh, avoid the collected water to spill off or to run off to some place else it just is to contain okay and with the help of this this cropped or khadan area the seepage in the underground increases all the water seeps through the soil and it is collected into inside the uh, underwater table which we can dug up from the dug well okay that being said we have the bandis bandis you must have heard about at a lot of places as well you know bandis are basically uh, man made or natural reservoirs kind of a pond little pond which uh, are just filled up with the water until uh, there is monsoon and after monsoon they dry up so it's just kind of a pond uh, kind of thing and those were really really used for the sake of rice cultivation in the areas okay and then we have the tankers now tankers are very very reliable they are also for the drinking water and uh, tankers are also the kind of Uh, tanks which are closed they could be underground they could be not underground that completely depends upon the people how they build it they could be above the ground they could be underground okay tankers are just like this they are like tanks basically if we talk about okay now that being said we have the um modern methods now going to the modern methods modern methods of water harvesting are equally uh, efficient and since they are modern methods you might just you know um, relate to them so we have the dams first of all we have the ground water tanks and uh, sorry we have the ground water dams and we have the ferro cement tanks ground water i hope you're noting this down with me tanks and ferro cement tanks dams i mean okay ground water dams correct this right now right so we have the ground water dams and we have the ferro cement tanks in order for you to understand what exactly is a ground water dam we have uh, see structures there are ground water dams are the ones which could be obstructing the natural flow of the ground water and all of that water is all of that ground water is collected at one place and then we insert a dug well okay or like not a dug well then we insert basically a tube well or we uh, kind of dug well as well okay so it is usually found in the india africa brazil most of the parts of the world so we kind of 
build a dam okay we build a dam and we obstruct the natural ground flow ground water flow and uh, so the water kind of collects at that particular area and then we insert a tube well and then we you know pump the tube well and we use that water so that is what ground water dams are and those ground water dams they are extremely advantageous why because the water is safe water is not evaporating water is kind of not contaminated as well and it stays there for a longer period of time right on top of that let me just show you the diagram now see this is the diagram that i was talking about if we talk about the groundwater dams groundwater dams are like this we have a tube well right and we have the groundwater we have the direction of the groundwater as well and we construct a stream level bed and we construct an obstruction basically which helps in collecting all that water at one place i've already discussed the advantages and everything and the next thing that we are going to move are the ferro cement tanks now these ferro cement tanks are nothing special but the tanks which are made up of cement okay cement tanks which you can find on top of many houses underground in many buildings in hospitals and parks okay on you can just find them anywhere let me just give you a picture in order for you to relate properly now moving to this ferro cement tank as the picture shows what you see right here is this is a tank this could either be placed in an open area that could this could either be constructed at the side of the house you know so if we have a house right here and at the side of the house if we construct a ferro cement tank right here this ferro cement tank will have a pipeline which will be attached to the house okay and this pipeline will be helped with a lot of water that will be collected from the rain right so these are the uh, different type of water harvesting system i hope you learned well right and moving forward to the forest and the wildlife now see forest and the wildlife this is one of uh, the most important th thing that you will be studying right here today and this also uh, let's say helps you in understanding what are the different terminologies which are used so i hope you have your pen and paper or the pen and notebook and you are uh, you're noting everything down whatever i say okay and i'm writing all the important terminologies so you see forest and wildlife they're extremely necessary i have already explained why in order to maintain the life on earth in order to maintain the population on earth be it us be it animals be it birds be it all the different kind of organisms which are present right so forest ecosystem ecosystem first of all what is ecosystem ecosystem is when living and non living things interact with each other so a system which is made by the help of interaction is what an ecosystem is okay now it could be primary secondary tertiary consumers in the food chain first of all you should understand what is a food chain food chain is a linear exchange of energy okay linear exchange of energy how let me just give you a very simple example grass eaten by grasshopper okay and then grasshopper eaten by a frog so let's say if this grass had energy of about 1% 0.1% was obtained by the grasshopper and 0.01% was obtained by the frog you see only 10% energy travels and this is what a food chain is now it has primary secondary tertiary consumers consumers when it comes it comes to the grasshopper which is the primary consumer grob uh, frog which is the secondary consumer and then after frog let's say if the, it, if it's an eagle it'll be tertiary consumer and this is the producer why because it is producing with the help of the photosynthesis i hope this is very very easy for you to understand this is something that you have been studying for a longer period of time right you see it kind of helps forest help in maintaining the biodiversity how because they provide with the habitat to live in they provide the resources for the sake of proliferation and thriving right now that being said we're going to watch a super cool video and i'm going to give you a lot of definitions during this video so just keep uh, up on your toes okay
All right, then everyone, let's just start with the video. All the things that you're seeing right here, uh, the biodiversity, flora and fauna, classification and normal endangered vulnerable species, all these species, all these class classifications, these are very, very important. And along these classifications, you're going to have to learn the examples as well, because those examples are equally important and they're going to help you in scoring more marks. OK, now moving ahead with the video, let's just get ahead with it. Biodiversity includes cultivated species, wildlife, and different types of life found on Earth. They are linked in a system through multiple network of interdependencies. What this guy is saying here, the interdependencies is what we just talked about the food chain and an accumulation of a lot of food chain is called as the food web. Okay, so let's just get on with it. As eagle depends on snake, snake on frog, frog on butterfly, butterfly on flowers, and flowers depends on sun. We humans are also dependent on the system for our existence. For example, we depends on trees for fresh oxygen. We depends on river for drinking water. We depends on soil that produces our food. India has 8% of the total number of species in the world. Flora and fauna in India, 10% of India's wild flora and 20% of its mammals are in danger. Flora, all the vegetation, fauna, all the animals, okay? Some of them are cheetah, pink-headed duck, Mountain, quail, forest, spotted owlet, and plants like Madhuka, Insignis, and Habardia, Heptaneuron. The names of the plants are basically the scientific names. In order for you to understand the scientific names, see, these names are not written in the exact a right uh, manner that they should have been written here. Whenever we write these scientific names, we make sure that the first name starts with a capital letter and the last name starts with a small letter. And we always underline them whenever we are writing them. And if we are typing them, that should always be in the italics. Okay, you'll be learning more about uh, naming of the organisms in the 11th standard. Now moving forward. The forest and tree cover in India is 23.81% of the total geographical area, out of which dense forest covers 12.24%, open forest covers 8.99%, and mangrove forest covers 0.14%. Classification of existing plants and animal species. Normal species are those whose population levels are considered to be normal for their survival examples are cattle pine and rodent endangered species are those which are in danger of death examples are crocodile indian tiger and sangai which is brow anta deer in manipa vulnerable species are those whose population has declined to levels from where it moves into the endangered category. Examples are blue sheep, Asiatic elephant, and dolphin. Rare species are those which have small population. Examples are Himalayan, brown bear, desert fox, and hornbill. Endemic species are those which are only found in some particular areas. Examples are Madhan in Arunachal Pradesh and Andaman wild pig. Extinct species are those which are not found after searching them in areas where they may occur. Examples are pink headed duck and cheetah. Different type of uh, 
All right. So we studied about a lot of terminologies related to what we have as the endangered species. Endangered are the ones which have the less population. Normal species, the number of uh, organisms in those species are, you know, okay for their survival for a longer period of time. And then we have the vulnerable species, which have extremely low um, population, extremely less population. Then we have the extinct species. Extinct are the one which have been completely wiped out from the face of the earth for example the dodo and the dinosaurs and we have the endemic species endemic species or the epidemic species are the ones which are found only in one area for example if we talk about uh, the different type of goats or the different type of uh, uh, you know yak let's say yak for example is only found in the snowy areas only in the few regions or if we talk about the sundarban uh, forest where we have the trees which are very specific to that particular reason, region itself right now that being said we are going to move forward to the conservation of the biodiversity now this right here is a very very big topic which you need to understand properly okay conservation is very important why the balance survival proliferation thriving earth human species continuation extinction and everything i hope you can relate to those keywords now see it's very very important for the sake of the uh, sustainable benefit or sustainable development to have the conservation of biodiversity. What is sustainable development that you need to know first of all? It is the development where we utilize the resources very judicially in the present and we save them for the future as well. Okay, so the uh, development which is being uh, carried out in a perfect balance in order to utilize the resources at present and in order to save the resources for the future generations as well. That is what sustainable or the balance development and benefits are okay as mentioned here for present and the future generation conservation is basically of two types okay i'm going to broadly describe all of it here and then i'm going to show you two videos on the basis of which you can easily uh, you know note down and decide everything properly so we have the in c2 and we have the xc2 in situ conservation is something which we uh, utilize by, you know, saving all the organisms in their own natural habitat, in their own natural environment. And ex situ conservation is when we save the animals, when we conserve the animals, but out of their normal environment, okay, out of their uh, actual environment. For example, if we talk about the in situ conservation, we talk about the national parks, we talk about, you must have studied about this in the ninth standard as well. It's just a quick revision of all of that. We have the national parks, we have the wildlife sanctuaries. And we have the biosphere reserve. On top of that, we have the XC2. XC2 can go ahead with the zoo. And we have the cryopreservation. Cryopreservation is when we use the liquid nitrogen, which is at the temperature of minus 196 degrees Celsius. And we you know kind of just freeze the things. Okay, and collection of rare plants in botanical gardens. The largest botanical garden is found in the Europe, the Royal Botanical Garden which belongs to the queen, obviously. Anyway, now that being said, let's just get ahead with the video. All right, now coming to this video, first things first, we should be learning about why should we conserve the biodiversity and then how should we conserve the biodiversity? Why and how two questions will be answered and extremely important, make sure that you pay attention over here, okay? They are A, narrowly utilitarian, B, broadly utilitarian and C, ethical.
I'm so sorry. Right. So let's uh, let's see. I'll be explaining all of that for you so that we don't have to waste our time watching the entire video. Narrowly utilitarian are the things which are not of as much use to us, but they are kind of you know have a narrow spectrum of usage to the human beings. And then we have the broadly utilitarian, which are like extremely extremely useful for us, and the human beings are kindly exploiting everything. And then ethical is something which uh, is related to how exactly the different habitat belong to the different species, and we should let them be. Okay, we should just let them be in peace. Now moving forward with the video. Narrowly utilitarian reasons. The narrowly utilitarian arguments for conserving biodiversity are obvious. Humans derive countless direct economic benefits from nature. They are food, fiber, firewood, construction material, industrial products, and products of medicinal importance. More than 25% of the drugs currently sold in the market worldwide are derived from plants and 25,000 species of plants contribute to the traditional medicines used by native people around the world. In the present condition, how many more medicinal plants had to explore in tropical plants? With increasing resources put into bioprospecting, Nations with rich biodiversity can expect to reap enormous benefits. Broad Utilitarian This argument says that biodiversity plays a major role in many ecosystem services that nature provides. Example A. Oxygen supply The Amazon forest is estimated to produce 20% of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere through photosynthesis. B. Pollinators' role. Pollination is another service in the nature. Ecosystem provides, through pollination layer, bees, bumblebees, birds, bats. There are other intangible benefits which we derive from nature. Example, the aesthetic pleasures of walking through thick woods, watching spring flowers in full bloom, wake up, in a bulbul's song in the morning. We can't put a price tag to the ecosystem services which are playing a vital role in conserving biodiversity. Ethical argument. According to this argument, philosophically or spiritually, we need to realize that every species has an intrinsic value, even if it may not be of current or any economic value to us. We have a moral duty to care for their well-being and pass on our biological legacy in good order to future generations. How do we... See, basically, let me just, you know, uh, take it out to you in a very, uh, a very summary, summarizing manner. First thing, narrowly utilitarian, we basically we have the uses which are economical, broadly utilita utilitarian. Uh, the uses are the ones which help in surviving on this planet. And third is the ethical, where we kind of, you know, have the morals to hand down whatever we have received to the future generations uh, in the same conditions or in the better condition that we have received it. Okay. Now, moving forward to the how exactly do we conserve the biodiversity, right? We conserve biodiversity. Its biodiversity at all levels is protected. Example, when we save the forests, tigers are also saved. Biodiversity conservation occurs in two ways. A. In situ conservation and B. Ex situ conservation. In situ conservation. Many nations faced with the conflict between development and conservation find it unrealistic and economically not feasible to conserve all their biological wealth. Invariably, the number of species waiting to be saved from extinction far exceeds the conservation resources available. On a global basis, this problem has been addressed by eminent conservationists. They identified for maximum protection certain biodiversity hotspots, regions, with very high levels of species richness and high degree of endemism. Initially, 25 biodiversity hotspots were identified 
but subsequently nine more have been added to the list bringing the total number of biodiversity hotspots in the world see now you understand what hotspots are hotspots are the regions which have the high variety of biodiversity and they are rich in the species be it for the plants be it for the animals okay moving forward to 34 these hotspots are also regions of accelerated habitat loss three of these hotspots western ghats and sri lanka indo burma and himalaya cover our country's exceptionally high biodiversity regions although all the biodiversity hotspots put together cover less than 2% of the earth's land area the number of species they collectively harbor is extremely high and strict protection of these hotspots could reduce the ongoing mass extinctions by almost 30% in india ecologically unique and biodiversity rich regions are legally protected as biosphere reserves national parks and sanctuaries india now has 14 biosphere reserves 90 national parks and 448 wildlife sanctuaries india has also a history of religious and cultural traditions that emphasize protection of nature in many cultures tracts of forests were set aside and all the trees and wildlife were venerated and given total protection such sacred groves are found in khasi and jaintia hills in meghalaya aravalli hills of rajasthan western ghat region of karnataka and maharashtra and the sargat chand and bastar areas of madhya pradesh in meghalaya the sacred groves are last refuges for a large number of rare and threatened plants Hi, I'm Nick, and we're here at Strathmore University in Nairobi, Kenya. We're here installing a Huawei Sun 2000 10KTL inverter. This is the oldest PV training school in Kenya, so we're happy. Exit. All right then moving forward with this one to conservation in this approach threatened animals and plants are taken out from their natural habitat and placed in special settings where they can be protected and given special care botanical gardens zoological parks wildlife safari parks serve the purpose there are many animals that have become extinct in the wild but continue to be maintained in zoological parks now see one such example is the panda china has done an incredible job in taking the panda out of the endangered and vulnerable species now they have a lot of uh, population of panda and that is a very good thing that has been done on the human part now moving forward with the video let's just go ahead with it in recent years ex situ conservation has advanced beyond keeping threatened species in enclosures now gametes of threatened species can be preserved in viable and fertile condition for long periods using cryopreservation techniques eggs can be fertilized in vitro and plants can be propagated using tissue culture methods seeds of different genetic strains of commercially important plants can be kept for long periods in seed banks biodiversity knows no political boundaries and its conservation is therefore a collective responsibility of all nations the historic convention on biological diversity the earth summit held in rio de janeiro in 1992 called upon all nations to take appropriate measures for conservation of 
biodiversity and sustainable utilization of its benefits. In a follow-up, the World Summit on Sustainable Development held in 2002 in Johannesburg, South Africa, 100 countries pledged their commitment to achieve, by 2010, a significant reduction in the current rate of biodiversity loss at global, regional and local levels. The IUCN Red List Categories The International Union of Conservation of See, all these abbreviations, IUCN, the International Union of Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, which is maintaining the uh, Red Data Book or the Red List, these are very important. So pay attention to this especially, okay? Nature and Natural Resources, IUCN, maintain a document called Red List or Red Data Book of taxa that are facing the risk of extinction. Now, I hope all of that really helped you. And now I'm going to ask a few questions and then we can conclude the session. So what are the four type of natural resources which are found? We did all of those. Natural resources, which are renewable, non-renewable, which are living, the biodiversity basically, and which are fossil fuels or non-living, as in the coal, petroleum, etc., etc. Right? Next question, how can we conserve forest and wildlife? We just did a thorough discussion on this one. Okay, so we're going to move forward with the answer. We have the national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, uh, and we have the zoos and breeding and everything, you know, uh, putting into the storage, such as the seed bank or the cryopreservation preservation that we just talked about. But I'd suggest you always start this question with in C2 and X C2. That is going to lend you more marks, okay? Because the examiner will see that how well uh, constructed your answer is, okay? Now, that being said, that's all for today. And I'll become Coming back with the next session of this chapter and I'll see you soon you guys take care have fun and do a lots of learning see ya